Hi, my name is Grant Kramer, and I am a professor emeritus at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today is lecture five of my plant physiology series, part two of ion transport. In part one, we talked about the driving forces for ion transport and the molecular mechanisms, the ion transporters, and how they transport ions across a membrane over short distances. Today, in this lecture, we'll be talking about the uptake kinetics, the pathways of transport, and the long distance transport through the plant. This is important as we will find out that plants can adapt to low nutrient conditions by adjusting their various transporters. And that under toxic conditions like saline conditions, where concentrations are too high, they can exclude the ions or somehow move them around to avoid the toxicity. So why do some plants grow in some conditions and other plants don't? It's due to their genetic diversity and their different kinds of ion transport mechanisms. Let's begin lecture five on ion transport part two, uptake kinetics, pathways, and long distance transport. Okay, so this is a picture of Emmanuel Epstein. He's a mentor of mine. I worked in his laboratory at one time. He is a member of the National Academy of Science, and he was a pioneer in plant mineral nutrition and ion transport. And I'm going to highlight some of the things that he discovered in this next part of the lecture. The thing that made Emmanuel Epstein probably most famous was the discovery that ion transporters were enzymes or proteins. This was before we knew about any of the proteins in the membrane, and he discovered this by understanding what we call michaelis menten kinetics, which are designed for enzyme kinetics. And prior to this, no other scientist had ever made this realization. He noticed that, in, as in this red line, that transport of an ion into a cell or a root had this curvilinear response. If it had been by simple diffusion, it would be linear, but it's this curved linear response. And this curve, it turned out, fit michaelis menten kinetics, which is described here on the right-hand side by this equation, which is V equals V max times the substrate concentration, or in this case, the ion concentration, S, divided by the Km, or michaelis menten constant, plus the substrate concentration. This had already been defined in biochemistry before, and V stands for the velocity of the reaction, or in this case, ion uptake. V max is equal to the maximum velocity, which can be equated to the number of transporters in that membrane. Km is defined as the rate at half V max. So we have a V max, which is where the carrier transport or the enzyme reaction is at its maximum and can no longer increase. And so therefore, half Vmax is determined as the concentration of that substrate at half Vmax. We can see the dotted lines from half Vmax down to the Km. And this is the external concentration of the transported molecule in this case. Another term for the Km of an enzyme or ion transporter is the affinity. So the Km represents the affinity of the ion transporter to bind the ion. At a lower Km, it has a higher affinity. That is, it's able to bind the same amount of ion at the concentration that is lower than another enzyme or transporter. We'll see what the significance of this is in a moment. So why measure Km and Vmax? Let's give a, an example. Let's say we had a corn plant and we measured its potassium uptake and found that it could take up potassium at 10 micromoles per gram per hour into its roots across its membranes, assuming all membranes are the same here. And we know that the external concentration of the potassium chloride in the solution around the root was 100 micromolar. And we determined already that the Vmax, or the maximum rate of uptake for the root, was 100 micromoles per gram per hour. So let's figure out what's the Km of this using the michaelis menten equation. We can solve 
for the km. And I'll show you that example in a moment. Now let's compare that to a beam plan that has only half the uptake at the same Vmax and the same external concentration. So it has a rate of five micromoles rather than 10 micromoles per gram per hour. Which plant, corn or bean, has a higher affinity for potassium uptake and why? Why is that important? Well, that affinity of higher binding will allow it to take up potassium at much lower concentrations than the other plant if it has a higher affinity for potassium. So let's solve for the corn plant first. So here's the michaelis menten equation up in the left-hand corner. We know that the velocity of uptake is 10 micromoles per gram per hour, as just given. We know what the Vmax is, which is 100 micromoles per gram per hour. And we know the external concentration for potassium is 100 micromolar. So we substitute that into the equation, and Km is now in the denominator with the 100 micromolar substrate concentration as defined by the equation on the left. So now we need to do a rearrangement of this equation and solve for Km. So we do some rearrangement by bringing over the Km plus 100 micromolars to the left-hand side of the equation. And we get Km plus 100 micromolar times 10 micromoles per gram per hour is equal to 100 micromoles per gram per hour times 100 micromolar. So we're going to bring that transport rate over to the left-hand side of the equation from the right-hand side, the 100 micromoles per gram per hour. And now we have 10 micromoles per gram per hour divided by 100 micromoles, which the units drop out, and we have 10 over 100 which is equal to 1 over 10. So now our equation has simplified on the left-hand side to Km plus 100 micromolar over 10 equals 100 micromolar. Again, we can simplify by multiplying both sides of the equation by 10, and we get the 10 dropping out on the left-hand side, and we now have 1,000 micromolar on the right-hand side. The final step of this is then to bring the 100 micromolars from the left-hand side of the equation over to the right-hand side, and that gives us Km is equal to 900 micromolar. I'm sorry I did not go through all the mathematical steps, but this is the correct solution. If you want to solve it on your own, please feel free to put it on some paper and look at it. So how does that compare to the bean plan? Well, this is what I would do for my class. I'd say that's for you in class now to figure out how to solve this equation for the beam with the example I just gave you for corn. However, you are on my video and not in my class, and I'm sure you don't want to really take the time to solve this problem. So I provided you with the solution. And if we look at the beam, the difference is we have a rate of uptake of five micromoles per gram per hour. Now, if we go through the same workings of the formula and balancing the equation on both sides, we come up with a Km that's equal to 1900 micromolars. So what does that mean? A Km that is larger has a lower affinity. It means that the corn had a higher affinity at 900 micromolar and the bean plant had a Km of 1,900 micromolar. Higher Km means a lower affinity. So the bean plant was unable to take as much up from this 100 micromolar potassium solution because its transporter had a lower affinity for the potassium ion. So the michaelis menten kinetics also led to other discoveries that Epstein had originally done in 1952 before all the other animal scientists. And he did this experiment on the left-hand side here that was published in 1963. On the y-axis here is the rate of potassium uptake. And on the x-axis is the concentration of the potassium. And in this case, he's using rubidium as a tracer for potassium because rubidium functions in the same way as potassium. And he'd already shown that in the past. I won't go into those details. But you can see this michaelis menten curve on the left-hand side as the concentrations are very, very low. We're talking in the micromolar range. And on the right side of this x-axis, we get to the millimolar concentrations. 
and we see another curvilinear response. And thus, he postulated that there were two different transporters operating in two different concentration ranges. One transporter was transporting potassium in micromolar ranges, and another potassium transporter was transporting potassium at millimolar ranges. This is very useful for the plant if you think about it. Sometimes the potassium concentration may be extremely low in the soil, and these micromolar transporters are going to be very important. But they won't be able to transport anything in higher concentrations because they're already saturated at a very low concentration. And thus, to take up more potassium, then you need either more transporters or you need another kind of transporter that will have a lower affinity that will bind more potassium at higher concentrations. And so in, in this figure, you can see that curvilinear response with the circles. Now, there's another interesting side to this in which it shows the circles are showing with the anion having been a chloride ion. When the anion is a sulfate ion, you see that the uptake of potassium is highly reduced compared to the chloride. I'll explain this in a few slides from now. On the right-hand figure here, we can see a figure by Cochin and Lucas that was published in 1982. And it shows uptake starting with a curvilinear response at the low concentrations, but at higher concentrations, it has a linear response. They can show that there are two different kinds of responses. There's this michaelis menten response, and then there's this linear response. Turns out, that in fact, this response on the left-hand side in Epstein's was somewhat misleading because the curvilinear response actually is in part because of the way the graph has been plotted, which is at two different scales and thus making this actual linear response look curvilinear. So if we look at the right-hand side, this is very informative in some ways. We know that this michaelis menten kinetics may represent a carrier type of transporter. And this linear response that we see as we get to higher concentrations is a result of ions diffusing through a channel. So we have two forms of transporters going on in this uptake kinetic graph. So not all ions can move through a transporter. These transporters are selective. And here's a graph showing that. Now, one of the ways that we measure ion transport is by using radioisotopes because they can very sensitively detect the movement of ions across the membrane. It's one of the things I studied in my PhD thesis in the laboratory there. And so potassium-42 was used here and was in the external solution at a one millimolar concentration. And if we look at the uptake of potassium into the cell, we have some value that we'll call 100 or 100% 100 under control conditions with only one millimolar potassium in the solution. If we then add an additional one millimolar sodium to the solution, we can see that so sodium has slightly inhibited the rate of uptake, so it's only at 94%. If we were to substitute cold potassium, that's not radioactive potassium, we've now got a one millimolar concentration of radioactive potassium and one millimolar potassium concentration of non-radioactive potassium. This will cause a reduction in the uptake of the radio tracer because we now have both radioactive and non-radioactive competing for the same binding site. And thus, we get only half the rate of uptake on average, or 54%. Again, to show that rubidium has the same effect, we get an uptake of only 56% when one millimolar cold rubidium is added to the nutrient solution. When we add cesium, we have barely any effect on the uptake of potassium, or what we might say is almost insignificant at 97%. And interestingly enough, when we add calcium, which has a plus two charge, we actually get a stimulation of potassium transport so that we get an uptake of 30% more than with a, just a control solution. I'll come back to that point in a moment as to what effect calcium is having. But what you notice is that there are ion-specific effects occurring here. 
each ion is having a different effect on the transport of potassium. This has to do with the membrane structure, but also with the ion transporter itself, as it controls the specificity based on its structure as well. And this represents a form of ion competition where cations are competing with other cations for the same binding site. Well, we now know from other competitive interactions that there are other effects that can happen with other transporters. So we know that calcium and magnesium compete with each other for calcium and magnesium transporters. So calcium will inhibit magnesium transport and magnesium will inhibit calcium transport. Likewise, chloride competes with nitrate. And so again, nitrate will inhibit chloride transport and chloride will inhibit nitrate transport and selenate will inhibit sulfate transport. Now, now selenate is not an essential element for plants, but this is actually kind of an interesting story because selenate is taken up by plants and in California, there are issues with higher selenate concentrations in plants that become toxic to waterfowl. So although selenate will inhibit sulfate uptake and may in some cases cause some problems for plants, it's the reverse where there's a practical application of applying sulfur to the soils that allow it to inhibit the uptake of selenate and thus reduce the toxicity. So I mentioned the stimulation of transport in the case earlier of chloride and potassium transport being much higher for the potassium ion transport when there was chloride in solution versus sulfate. And one of the reasons for this is that cations and anions, if they move across the membrane together, in this case, chloride as a negative charge and potassium as a plus charge, they will go across and neutralize the differences in charge. Remember, if a potassium ion just went across, it would reduce the electric potential slightly. Remember, the electric potential is negative, so that plus charge will depolarize and reduce the electric potential. This will reduce the driving force now for another potassium ion. So if the chloride goes across, it balances that charge without diminishing or depolarizing the membrane potential and thus doesn't reduce the driving force for potassium uptake. So you get synergistic effect of that negative charge. So why does sulfate inhibit transport? It has two negative charge. Well, the reason is that sulfur transport is much slower than chloride transport across the membrane. So it cannot get across the membrane it's not very permeable very quickly. And as a result, the potassium goes across very quickly and actually ends up depolarizing the membrane potential and reducing its uptake. So in the schematic here on the right, I am showing you with large arrows that this transport process is much faster because of the transport of chloride to facilitate the transport of potassium. And we can see that the sulfur transport is much slower and it limits the rate at which the potassium can cross the membrane. The other synergistic effect is the result of the importance of calcium. As Epstein first discovered that calcium was important in the transport of ions, that it was necessary for the integrity of the membrane and the stability of the membrane. This was also part of my research in my PhD thesis, following up on some of the early observations of Emmanuel Epstein on the importance of calcium and its effect on membranes. So the membranes are made up of phospholipids. Here we see a phospholipid that has a phosphate head group, and this has a negative charge to it. And if we look at the membrane, we would see that a calcium ion, which has plus two charges, can have two electrostatic charges, one with each phospholipid group, if it has one negative charge, as many of the phospholipids do. And by having the electrostatic bond with these phospholipids, it restricts their movement. Now, remember, membranes have a fluidity to them, and these phospholipids are floating around like in a sea, moving around. 
And by calcium binding to them, it restricts their movement and makes them more rigid. If a sodium ion comes in with a plus one charge and displaces that calcium off of a membrane, then this frees up the phospholipids and changes the fluidity of the membrane. And it turns out, as I'll show you in a moment, this causes leakiness in the membrane because now there's more movement in these membranes. But enzymes that are in the membrane, including those transporters, are also dependent upon the fluidity of the membrane. If it's too rigid, then they can't move around and do the things that they need to. And if it's too fluid, then they don't function properly either. There's a certain balance of fluidity that's needed. So when calcium is displaced from the membrane, it causes dysfunction of the membrane and it can inhibit the ion transport mechanisms. This is shown here where we can see the effects of calcium on ion transport and on ion selectivity. So in the upper left-hand figure, we can see the rate of potassium uptake as shown by rubidium being absorbed. Remember, it acts as a good tracer for potassium. And with calcium, we see this nice linear uptake over time. When calcium is not in the external solution, and therefore it's diminishing the amount of calcium bound to the outer surface of the membrane, we see that potassium uptake is inhibited. But once we add some calcium, we see a stimulation of potassium uptake. So this clearly shows that calcium is necessary in the external solution for potassium to be taken up properly. Fortunately, for us, calcium is very prevalent in soil solutions around the world and is usually there to help improve the uptake of potassium. On the right side of that figure, we can also see another graph of potassium being absorbed where potassium uptake is stimulated or higher at external, higher external calcium concentrations versus lower external calcium concentrations. So there's a happy medium. Too much calcium could be a problem, but too little is also a problem. And under saline conditions, so that, so those two figures are under the normal field-like conditions that you might find in normal non-saline conditions. But what I studied in my PhD was the impact of salinity. And under saline conditions, we can see two figures here. One is on the left-hand side, the rate of potassium efflux. So now I'm measuring the amount of potassium that is leaking out of a root, not being taken up, but literally coming out of the root at different sodium chloride concentrations in the external solution. So these would be saline solutions, seawater or some other saline type condition. And we can see at 50 millimolar sodium chloride, there's no leakage. At 100, there's no leakage. At 150 now, we're starting to see a higher amount of leakage. Now, seawater is about 500 or 450. So this is much less than seawater concentrations. And if we were to look at the two different figures, the open circles there are concentrations of external calcium concentration that are low at about 0.4 millimolar. And the ones with the solid circles are concentrations of about 10 millimolar calcium. And we can see that there's much higher amounts of leakage of potassium at this low calcium versus high. So calcium, high external calcium concentrations are preventing the leakage of potassium out of the membrane. Now in the right-hand figure, we're seeing same type of experiment, but now we're looking at the, the sodium uptake or sodium influx into the cell. And we can see just the opposite is happening where high calcium is competing with the sodium and depressing the amount of sodium being taken up at low calcium. There's higher rates of uptake of sodium into the root when there's lower external calcium concentrations. So this is competitive interaction. And remember, this looks very linear, suggesting that in fact, this is operating on a channel that is allowing sodium into the cell through a sodium channel. Okay, what other factors can influence 
ion transport. And it happens to be factors that influence metabolism. So anything that influences metabolism is going to affect ion transport. So the oxygen concentration, if we have anaerobic or anoxic conditions where we have low oxygen concentrations, then the root will not be able to make ATP or produce energy to be able to do its normal transport functions and uptake or efflux will be impacted by that. Temperature will also have an effect. Obviously, as temperature warms up, metabolism warms up, energy increases, and this will impact the rate of transport. Vice versa, when the soils are cold, the roots are negatively impacted by that and have a harder time taking up nutrients or keeping their nutrients from leaking out of the cell. Anything that affects, therefore, carbohydrates will affect energy in the non-photosynthetic cells. So the transport of carbohydrates from the leaves to the roots will impact their ability to produce energy. And in the photosynthetic cells in the leaves, then light can have direct effects, not only on the energy status, but we'll find out light energy can be used to transport ions within the leaf cell as well. Okay, so what have we learned so far? We've learned that influx is dependent upon the number of transporters or channels. The more there are, the more transport can occur. The influx is also dependent upon the affinity of the transporters. The higher affinity, the more that can be transported, as we calculated through that michaelis menten equation. We also learned that influx is dependent upon the electrochemical potential gradient, which is dependent upon the external concentration, the membrane potential, and the internal concentration. And the internal concentration of that ion is dependent upon the rate of efflux. So the faster the efflux, that will lower the concentration inside. And it also be dependent upon its translocation out of the cytoplasm into the vacuole or all the way to the chute, as we'll see in long distance transport. And it also can be the result of feedback inhibition. I haven't told you this, but those transporters can be influenced by the internal concentration, which can cause a conformational change in the transporter, which will change its KM or its affinity of that transporter. So when there are high concentrations of potassium, the transporter loses its affinity because of a conformational change in the protein of the transporter and therefore doesn't transport as much. Vice versa, as the concentration of potassium decreases in the cytoplasm and the plant starts to become starved of potassium, then its transporter will change its conformation and change its affinity for that potassium and be able to take up much more potassium. Pretty cool. And as I said in the last slide before this, potassium transport is also dependent upon the energy status for obvious reasons. So how are ions transported or translocated through and along the route? Very similar to water transport, we need to look at the structure of the root tip. Remember, the Casparian strip was very important in blocking the apoplastic pathway and forcing water to move into the symplastic pathway where the Casparian strip became mature. If you're not familiar with this, then you need to go back to my previous lecture on water transport and review this topic. But suffice it to say, at the root tip, there's a greater rate of ion transport because there is no Casparian strip. So this graph on the right is showing you the rate of water uptake, but that water is also carrying ions into the root and it also represents the transport rate that would occur for ions. And where the Casparian strip has developed and where subrization has occurred along the root, the rate of ion uptake is diminished. So here again is a refresher on the pathway in the root. So we have the epidermal cells on the left, we have the cortical cells in the middle, and then we have the endodermal cells where the endodermis is and the Casparian strip is formed. And on the interior of that, in the steel portion of the root, 
we have some living cells known as xylem parenchyma. We'll come back to those in a moment. And we have xylem tracheary elements, which are part of the xylem, and these are dead cells. And this is the point where water is transported through these xylem vessels or tracheids from the root up to the shoot or leaves like a water pipe and carrying those ions up through the xylem to the leaves based on the rate of transpiration, which is dependent upon the stomata being open in the leaves. Again, if you're not clear with this, then go to my previous lecture on water transport. So the ions must cross a plasma membrane at the endodermis because this blockage in the Casparian strip prevents ions from moving through the apoplast, through the cell walls, all the way into the xylem. And this gives the plant important controls by forcing ions to be transported across the plasma membrane through selective ion transporters. It can choose which ions to let into the plant and which ions to prevent coming into the plant. Remember, some minerals are not helpful to the plant and can be toxic to the plant. The plant wants to be selective and only take up ions that it needs that are essential mineral elements. The transport pathway between these cells is through plasma dysmodal connections, as with water transport. And like water transport, these ions can move from the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of another cell through the pores or these plasma dysmodal connections. And again, for a more detailed description, see my previous lecture on water transport. We also talked in the previous lecture about something called root pressure. And I said I would explain how this occurs. Well, now that we know something about ion transport, we can understand this process. So root pressure usually is observed first thing in the morning, causing guttation out of the edge of the leaves. This is the result of the stomata being closed first thing in the morning. When light occurs, the stomates would open up and transpiration would occur, and this would cause water to flow out of the xylem, reducing the pressure, in fact, creating a negative tension. So this root pressure can force water, and the ions can move by mass flow with the water molecules as it is being pressurized. So how does this occur? We have the transport of many ions going across the root, as I just explained, and being transported into the xylem across the membranes of the xylem parenchyma cells. They get loaded into the xylem and become more concentrated. When transpiration is occurring, the ion concentration will be very low because the rate of water moving in is faster than the rate of ions moving in, and it will dilute the ion concentration. But if the transpiration is low, then the xylem ion concentration will increase because the ion transport is faster than the water transport, which is non-existent at that point. And so this decreases the solute potential inside the xylem. We have two compartments on each side of that membrane, one of a living cell of the xylem parenchyma and one of a dead cell of the xylem vessel. And this decrease in Solute potential decreases the water potential inside the xylem, and it causes the water to move from high water potential inside the xylem parenchyma cell across the membrane into the xylem. And this creates pressure. So we have water flow moving down its water potential gradient. So you can't forget about what we learned about water flow, driving uptake into the xylem parenchyma, which forces water more water molecules in, pushing those water molecules up the xylem column. And this causes guttation, forcing water out of the end of the leaves. So what about long distance transport from the roots to the leaves? Well, we know that we have two different transport mechanisms, one of which we've talked about, one piping system known as the xylem, a tissue that's filled with dead cells that transports water and another one, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, called phloem. And phloem is a living tissue that moves sugars by mass flow. So when water moves in the xylem, it moves in one direction only, and it's driven by transpiration. So in this figure on the right-hand side, we can see red lines and red arrows. 
This is meant to represent the movement of water through the xylem, carrying those ions to wherever transpiration is occurring. Notice it's going to the leaves. The leaves are transpiring. Notice it is not going towards the fruit because the fruit is not transpiring because it does not have stomates on it. Ion transport can move bidirectionally in the phloem because the phloem is capable of moving in both directions in the plant, not just from the bottom upwards, but it can move from the bottom upwards and from the top downwards. To understand this, we have to look at source sink relationships, and we'll study that in the next lecture when we talk about phloem transport. We have specific cell types acting as specific transport cells that are important for the movement of ions in the xylem and for movement of ions and sugars in the flow. Xylem parenchyma cells are located next to the xylem vessels. They are living cells adjacent to these dead vessels, and they can remove ions from the solution in the xylem and bring them into the cell. These are so these xylem parenchyma cells are also known as transfer cells. And these are very interesting cells that are adjacent to the xylem vessels and the phloem tube cells that are needed for transport of the sugars or of water or ions. And these are living cells that are highly invaginated, as you can see here on the figure on the right, which is an electron micrograph through the cells. The one under A are a bunch of xylem parenchyma cells that, if you look very carefully, are next to xylem cells. The white cells are the dead xylem cells. They have no cytoplasm inside of them. They're empty tubes. And you can see adjacent to them, just on their side, cells with these very thick walls on one side of the cells next to the white. So if you look in the middle, you can see the two white cells and a, a living cell adjacent to those two white cells with very thick walls. On the right-hand side, you can see a blow-up of that. These are wall invaginations. Well, these wall invaginations also mean that the plasma membrane that goes along them is also increased in surface area. And this increases the amount of plasma membrane and therefore the amount of transporters. And we find that there are specific ion transporters that are put in these plasma membranes along here, in particular for potassium. So these transfer cells are capable of transporting potassium. And they can take up a large amount of potassium. They can also exchange those for sodium ions and remove the sodium from the xylem stream and therefore help to keep the sodium from the leaves, which can be toxic. My major professor, Andre Loikley at UC Davis, also studied under Emanuel Epstein, and he was a specialist in this area on xylem parenchyma cells and he identified that they were able to remove sodium from the xylem stream and exclude the sodium from those leaves and help protect plants. How are there limits to how much plants can do with that? In this picture, you can see a picture of us at a later date in his native country, Switzerland, where he retired to after he finished his professorship at UC Davis. So to summarize this lecture, ion uptake and transport in plants is obviously quite complex, as I've spent a lot of time here describing. In short distance transport, ions must be transported across cell membranes and are aided by specific ion transporters. Active transport is defined by the movement of an ion against its electrochemical potential gradient. Active transport process can be determined by the NERT's potential. And long distance transport from the roots to the shoot occurs through the xylem and can recirculate in the plant through the phloem if the ions are mobile in the phloem. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this lecture.
If you like this lecture and you want to see more lectures like this, then please like it on my YouTube channel, as this will highlight this video and give an opportunity for other people to notice it on YouTube and begin to watch this series as well. Have a great day.